So thank you very much for um, this uh, tentative title to discuss about lights and shadows of uh, immunotherapy. Can I have my slides? Okay, so these are my disclosure. Oh, this is the first one. So my disclosures. And then this is this is what we're talking about. So this is one of the uh, patients which we uh, which we treated at my um, institute, and this was a patient who was started on treatment on December 14. She had a metastatic disease. Uh, he had a metastatic disease, and after uh, six weeks, he already had a, a dramatic response, which continued on for uh, about a year, and I'll come back to that later. So when we talk about immunotherapy, now in clinical um, situation, I will only focus on PD-1, PD-L1, because that's where, where most of the data uh, are on. But again, as you have heard from the previous speaker, we have a lot of other uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in place, and um, just focusing on PD-1, which is one of them uh, over here, which is the interaction between dendritic cells and T cells and between the tumor and also with the macrophages, but you have heard that in extents um, just uh, in the for, uh, former speaker that there are a lot of these in place, but we have now the most data on PD-1, PD-L1. And I will first discuss the second line treatment and then uh, the first line treatment. So. Uh, what are the data which we have now? So the second line treatment, the mostly the primary endpoint is overall survival, and there the PD-1 or PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitors are compared to those ataxel. And these are all uh, studies where patients were treated, pre-treated with uh, platinum combination therapy, and the differences between these studies are whether all histologies are included, uh, the PD-1 status and the PD-1 cutoff. So this is one example, the OAK trial, which was presented at the ASMO meeting uh, late last year. And in that trial, atezolizumab, um, 1,200 milligrams, was compared to docetaxel in a pretreated, uh, a platinum pretreated population. And in this trial also, it was acceptable for patients to have two uh, lines of treatment. And uh, uh, but uh, apart from that, there were all histological subtypes included, and there was no pre-selection on the PDL1 status. And what we saw in that trial was that there was a clear benefit of the atezolizumab compared to docetaxel with a hazard ratio of 0.73. Well, again, similar. You've seen these slides before, but just to be complete in the overview, this is the keynote. Uh, 10 study where you can see that uh, pembrolizumab to two dosages was compared to um, docetaxel and also here we have an increase in the overall survival. The nivolumab arm was, uh, nivolumab studies were somewhat different so there were, these were non pdl one preselected patients but here these trials were separated into a separate squamous uh, trial and a non-squamous trial but both of these trials showed an increase in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.59 in the squamous trial and 0.73 in the non-squamous trial. So what we can conclude from this is that in the second line, both the PD-1 and the PD-L1 treatment shows a consistent increase in the overall survival compared to docetaxel. All these trials did reveal similar results. So then coming to the first line treatment, and here we have, of course, untreated stage four non-small cell lung cancer patients, and there, there's a comparison between the platinum chemotherapy combination and the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. There's no data on PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitors in randomized phase three, uh, phase, uh, randomized studies at this point. The differences between these studies is the PD-L1 cutoff level and uh, the percentage of histology, but I will not, not go into that. The primary endpoint of that study, of these studies, is the progression-free uh, survival. And this is the keynote 024 study. And in this study, was there was a first-line study where pembrolizumab was compared to the platinum uh, doublet, and in their patients were only included when they have more than 50% positivity for the PDL1. So more than 50% of tumor cells tumor cells in this instance should be stained with uh, PDL1. And uh, 
results of the study are shown here. So we have an, an increase in the progression-free survival, which is about four months. And uh, this was highly statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.5. This is also transferred into a increase in the overall survival, um, with, which was statistically significant, but of course these data are still uh, maturing up to now. And the other study which was done was the study with nivolumab. And in that study, there was also the comparison between chemotherapy and the PD-1 inhibitor, nivolumab. But here, there was an patient could be included when they had more than 1% of pd one expression. So patients who had a more than one um, tumor cell positive in a certain area were allowed to enter into uh, this trial. And in both of these trials, so patients are uh, continued on the immunotherapy until disease progression or unacceptable toxicity, so treatment beyond progression is allowed. And in the chemotherapy, when their patients are having disease progression, they can cross over to um, nivolumab. And here is the primary endpoint of that study, and it was chosen to do the analysis for the primary endpoint in the more than 5% pdl one positive patients. And as you can appreciate from this figure, there's no difference in progression-free survival in this population comparing chemotherapy to the PD-1 inhibitor. Well, there's also no difference in the overall survival in, uh, for in the, comparing the chemotherapy to the nivolumab arm. So what, what are the, the conclusion for the first-line treatment? I think we can say that the PD-1 treatment with pembrolizumab shows an increase in progression-free survival compared to those taxol in a highly selected study population. Sorry for the typos, but this is an older version of the presentation which is now in front, so sorry for that. Well, and then I come to the shadows, and uh, what you can see here is that this is the patient which I presented who was started on the PD-1 treatment in December 14, and then ultimately in January 17, so uh, just a, a month ago, we presented with a new bone lesion which was proven to be a metastatic site. So here we see that although this patient is doing quite well for a longer time, he ultimately developed a progression of the disease. And that is something which we see also when we look at the data for the longer follow-up. So what you can see here is that looking at the um, pd one inhibitor, that there is a decline still in the progression-free survival. And it fits into the talk which you heard uh, about the uh, immunological, of how our immune system is working, that probably these patients develop a secondary resistance and become, before were responsive to the, to the PD-1 treatment, but now become unresponsive due to the development of another escape mechanism. And that is what I highlighted here. So I think when we look into the uh, more in-depth analysis, that when we look into the progression-free survival, that there is a proportion of patients, the majority of patients, who don't have a benefit of the PD-1 treatment and who drop off quite quickly, and that there's another group of patients who have the target, and some of them will continue to have benefit of the PD-1 treatment, but the other ones will develop ultimately some kind of resistance, and then the tumor will escape again from our PD-1 treatment. And that's also seen when I, I put here the two uh, separate PD-1 um, first-line studies that you can see here, looking at the, um, the um, nivolumab trial where the per percentage of patients was more than 5%, you see a high drop in the number of patients very early at the start, which is not present in the high-expressing patients, but then ultimately you see them both declining. Also, in the high-expressing patients, you see that there's a decline in the, in the um, patients responding to the pembrolizumab. So the question is whether we, whether we really turn into a plateau in lung cancer patients. And again, it comes back to the fact that it is a targeted treatment. So as, as we discussed also during lunch, the question is whether we should give a targeted treatment to a 
patient who doesn't have the target. And the question is, of course, that we are, have, are facing up with problems how to determine this target. And this is just one example also which supports this. So this is the uh, trial of atezolizumab. And here you can see this is the expression of the PDL1. And what is also very difficult with these drugs is that for the, P for the atezolizumab, it's not only the tumor cell staining which is of importance, but also the tumor microenvironment. So they also um, tell the, they also uh, score the number of immune cells which is positive for PDL1. So you have here the patients who have uh, a negative P, uh, tumor cell staining and a negative immune cell staining, and you can see here that there's really not a benefit of the PDL1 treatment. While, for instance, here when patients are highly higher expressors, that you, there is this advantage. So, how can we bring light into the shadow? Well, the thing is that. Because the fact that we know that patients are responding, ultimately we could get them responding to uh, immunotherapy. And, well, there are a couple of things we can do. So patient selection will help us to enlarge the responding population. And, of course, pd one uh, expression enriches a population for responders, but it's, not, it's far from perfect at this point. And also we can, do at, we can look at combination treatments, so combination IO or combination with uh, chemotherapy. And this is what is done. So this is the uh, Keynote 021 study where patients who were treatment naive were treated either with the standard chemotherapy, which was carboplatin pemetrexate in this study, and it was compared to carboplatin pemetrexate combined with the pembrolizumab. And you saw this before, but this is from the publication that there is an increase in the progression-free survival in these patients, showing that the combination treatment did have an advantage of the monotherapy or, uh, treatment. Of course, this is the overall survival curve, and you can see here there's no difference at this point, but we have to uh, see how that works out when we get more data. Another thing is the combination treatment. So we um, look for combining different treatment, and this is from a study where, from a non-randomized study, where nivolumab was compared to ipilimumab, and um, there was there were some from the early phase results. There were some promising data, but just uh, two months ago, we got a press release from Bristol Myers saying that they will not continue on a rapid approval uh, path for this combination drug. So we don't know what that will mean for the study. So all the randomized studies which have now been done, we're looking at the combination ctle 4 pd one compared to PD-1 alone, compared to chemotherapy. These studies have been performed. We are awaiting the results, but we know now that they stopped the fast track approval. So we have to see how that transfers into um, the clinical results of the studies. And that's also true to, to uh, looking at the biology that you have to question whether a CTLA-4 and a PD-1 combination in, let's say, the non-inflamed immunosuppressive tumors as lung cancer is, is the optimal combination to treat patients with. So, um, to conclude, I uh, think that immunotherapy can now be considered as a new standard treatment in non-small cell lung cancer. It's still unclear about the patient selection. So, of course, as you've seen and I've heard before, PD-L1 is an option, but it's not the ideal marker. I think we are really into, uh, the, the immunotherapy is, is a whole new treatment. It's very novel that we are really seeing such uh, results, but we are just at the start of learning how we should uh, understand the immune system. And that's something which we as, as physicians also have to work on doing scientific research and also from more basic that we have to really develop scientific logical and not pharmaco pharmacological combinations to do future trials in. And the other thing which we don't know yet is about the scheduling of the treatment. So we have seen now that chemotherapy plus uh, pembrolizumab outperformed the chemotherapy arm, but what about 
when you sequence the treatment, is, this per, is it per se better for the overall survival that it is given at once, or can we give it sequentially? That are all things we uh, don't know yet, and certainly with the number of countries which, uh, in which the pembrolizumab arm is first-line uh, first treatment will be increasing, we are more and more facing to that kind of questions which we really have to give an answer to. Um, and with that, I want to close.